So a lot of times with these videos, I take existing scholarship on intelligence analysis, and I try to push it forward just a little bit and add my own little twist to it. This one's gonna be kind of similar, but I think the twist is, is much bigger um, because the scholarship is, is really, I wouldn't even say inconclusive, just really uncertain about this basic foundational question of can we teach good judgment? Can we teach people to be better at reasoning? Can we teach them to make better forecasts? Is that something that we can actually do? And so to, to talk about sort of where this skepticism comes from, I'm gonna initially highlight Phil Tetlock's book, Super Forecasters, which talks about um, what makes people able to make good predictions about the future and what things seem to inhibit their ability to make good predictions about the future. And one of the things that he noticed about the sort of accuracy people have when they make forecasts and predictions is their background, their education is not at all correlated. More education does not make you a better forecaster. Um, real life experience versus university experience versus um, international experience versus whatever doesn't really correlate with your ability to make better forecasts. Um, which is a little concerning, right? Because we would like to think that we can teach people to be better at working with information, to be better critical thinkers, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, in fact, one of the, well, there were a couple things that, that Tetlock flagged as being potentially bad uh, for us that we might want to avoid, uh, one of which is regular media appearances. Apparently, regularly being on television uh, is negatively associated with being a good forecaster. Uh, which actually kind of makes sense. People are brought onto television, not because they're thoughtful and reflective, but because they're willing to be boisterous and sort of throw out extreme positions and they're reliable voices, right? I know exactly how, you know, this particular pundit is going to react to this particular problem and I can bring them in to sort of have that reaction. And in fact, that strong ideological sort of bent of, I view the world through, the, through sort of one lens um, and one sort of ideological framework, whether it's left or right or whatever your ideological framework is, bringing that one framework to the table tends to make you a worse forecaster. But what does it mean to be better and how do we get better? And there's, I think, some reason to be skeptical about our ability to do this based on some of the existing research on teaching critical thinking. And so one of the things that we don't know about our approaches and, and how we go about doing this uh, is we don't actually know if the things that we're teaching when we teach critical thinking and when we teach structured analytic techniques, if these things actually work. Uh, they were introduced by Hoyer and others in the 1970s and it was sort of a response to here are biases that we have, we know affect people's reasoning and judgment and we think that being more systematic and doing these kind of things will counter that and there's sort of an assertion of face validity. It seems on the surface like these sorts of tasks, analytic techniques should help counter these biases. And tetlock has been really critical of this among others and saying, well, we don't actually know that. We haven't done the research. We haven't demonstrated that. And it's possible that in the process of correcting for one bias, we may exacerbate another bias. And so there's Again, uh, and this is a very academic kind of thing to say, yeah, that sounds really reasonable, but do we have the facts? And the fact of the matter is right now, we don't. There's the, the research on structured analytic techniques and whether or not they actually make us better is weak at the best of times. So that's one problem and one area where I think we need to do better. A second problem is that we don't actually know if the kind of training that we give to people is actually any good. I mostly work in a university environment where I think about curriculum over the course of like four years and building programs and how students will get different skills sort of added in and reinforced and sort of strengthened and then they sort of culminate in, in a capstone project where they're supposed to demonstrate the skills that they've gained and then the, the analytic tools that they've built over the course of that, that sort of four year time period. A lot of critical thinking training, however, is much more of a one-off um, you take a workshop or you do a class and that, that kind of training, it's really uncertain if that changes your behavior long term um, and changes how you can think long term. Ideally, your training will be regular, right? You'll keep coming back to it. Um, you'll keep reinforcing those patterns. 
Um, it'll be realistic. The kind of problems you'll be working with are the kind of problems that exist in the real world. I've been looking at a lot of the sort of training on, on critical thinking and you know, one of my favorite books, the, the Jones's uh, the Thinker's Toolkit, has a really great example of teaching uh, the analysis of competing hypotheses using a uh, sort of scenario of the USS Iowa explosion from the 1980s. And it's fantastic and it's got complexity and it's problem solving, but it's also canned. It, uh, Jones goes through and distills out, you know, 200 facts that are relevant to the situation, 200 facts are relevant to four hypotheses that are kind of, you know, handed to you, and your job is to kind of fit the facts to the hypotheses and build your matrix. But in the real world, your facts don't come sort of prepackaged. You're, you're distilling them from massive amounts of information, and it's unclear what actually is a fact and what's, you know, denial or deception or what's, you know, contradictory information from, you know, multiple sources, the world is much more messy. And so you're working with a variety of different sort of problem solving and judgment tasks while trying to do this other thing. And none of that gets reflected in the kind of training that we oftentimes do uh, when we teach critical thinking in sort of a, a one-off sort of situation, right? So maybe a, a mentorship program um, or regular sort of check-ins would be better on the other hand, we don't know. We, we haven't done the research to find out what actually is the right strategy to teach critical thinking. And a third problem is we don't know that if that actually teaching critical thinking gets people to actually use critical thinking skills. And this is something that um, Damien and Careless flag uh, when they sort of look at the reasoning processes that analysts use working through a problem. And they note the folks who've been trained in sort of critical thinking and structured analytic techniques don't actually exhibit that in the way they talk about um, the data and the information any more than people who haven't been trained. And this kind of flagged for me uh, example uh, that was highlighted, I believe, War in the Rocks, uh, which was talking about U.S. counterinsurgency in Afghanistan under McChrystal and how McChrystal was really pushing you know, local commanders to build relationships with local leaders um, and, and tribal elders and so the, the War on the Rocks article said, oh, and so the, the commanders began writing reports about how they had tea with the local leaders. And the subtext of that was, yeah, they continued to do exactly what they had done before. Their behavior hadn't changed. What changed was what they put in their reports and told McChrystal they were doing because that's what he wanted to hear. And that there's a, a concern that maybe uh, structured analytic techniques and pushing for, you know, incorporating different critical thinking strategies into analysis is essentially doing the same thing that analysts are doing what they were doing before. They haven't really changed with their behavior, but when they go to tell you what they did, they're like, yes, I use this technique and this technique and this technique, and it doesn't actually do anything. So that's a little disconcerting. Um, and I think left me kind of uncertain about what was the way forward. And so I started thinking about my own sort of effort to develop critical thinking for myself and, and to, to incorporate the use of these strategies. And I subjectively think I've gotten better over the years, um, but it was really triggered by an experience I had where I was called, um, I think back in like 2014, by a radio program and asked, you know, do I think that Congress will approve uh, military action against Syria? And I said, oh yeah, there's no way Congress would ever, you know, stop a president from conducting U.S. foreign policy. And this seems something that's fully in line with the United States has been doing for the last 10 years. I don't see any problem. And Congress didn't approve uh, the Obama administration taking military action in Syria against the Assad regime. And I was really frustrated by that. Um, and I was frustrated both that I had made such a, a shoddy prediction and that I had done so publicly. And so I spent that summer <laughs> Uh, reading uh, a couple books. I read Tetlock's uh, Super Forecasters. I read um, uh, Signal and Noise by Nate Silver. And I read Jones's The Thinker's Toolkit. And I recognize that like there's these things that I can do and these processes that I can do to become a better reasoner, a better forecaster. But was I actually using them? And so I started looking around for ways to, to to practice and to push myself. And it turns out there was, you know, a, a something that was sort of waiting for me um, with the Good Judgment Project, which I think is now called um, the Open Judgment Project or Good Judgment Open. I'll throw a link in the description. Uh, I've got a couple screenshots here because I want to talk through um, kind of what this project does and some of the cool things about it. 
So this is a, a free place where you can practice your judgment and people um, from all over the world sign up. And you know, once you have an account, you log in, they have you know questions that you can answer and, and provide predictions for. And it gives you an opportunity to kind of practice. Uh, they're very they're structured questions, so you know, what's the likelihood of Roe versus Wade being overturned, or um, you know something like that. And you can give probabilistic answers, um, and it will sort of look. And after a period of time, it will sort of evaluate whether you got it right or wrong, and then it will give you a score about how well you're doing. And so uh, this is the the. Uh, Breyer or Beer score, I really should have heard it pronounced before I start trying to say it. Um, but the idea is that it, it looks roughly at how well you do, squares it, adds it together. So lower scores mean that you have, um, you're have you off in your probability forecast by less. Um, higher scores means you're off in your probability forecast by more. Uh, I did a number of, of these forecasts for years and then I lost my account. And so this is not my, my full account. This is a, a, a more recent one that I created for these videos. Um, but I took some time and actually did, did a forecast about um, would the United States end up fighting a naval confrontation with Iran in the next year. I think it, this forecast ran from like December 2020 through January 2021 and they sort of give you this structured question and allow you to sort of build up your answer yes or no, which is kind of nice. You can also see how other people have answered this question over time and what has been the aggregate forecast. Uh, and so the initially in December, there was a lot of sense that yes, the United States and Iran would be fighting a naval confrontation. Uh, but by January, and that's sort of the dotted green up and down line on there, the majority had sort of settled down to say no. And as time passes, people go in and they revise their scores, which is something I should probably be doing to get a more accurate uh, forecast, but they've revised their scores to to reflect sort of where they thought things were now, and eventually converges on no zero percent likelihood, which is in line with what happened. The United States and Iran did not fight a naval confrontation during that time period. So that's kind of interesting, and I think that's a, a useful um, tool to kind of think about your own forecasting relative to other people's forecasting. Uh, but then you can also sort of give a rationale uh, for why you think this. And so I went through and pulled out a couple rationales because not only writing my own rationales was useful, but looking at sort of how other people uh, justified what they're doing and, and justified their reasoning process. And I want to flag a couple of these. So this one, um, right now the U.S. president doesn't even remember where the Pentagon is located. This is sort of a classic um, sort of flippant response. Um, and you get people making these kind of judgments all the time where they say, you know, a, a throwaway almost insult is part of their reasoning process. Uh, and I think we could look at that and say, well, that's sort of flippant or that's, you know, a, not a rigorous analysis and recognizing those and dismissing those as that's a knee jerk shotgun kind of reasoning process, not something rigorous. So here's another one. Um, this one is, there are some saber rattling going on by the Iranians, and though the US uh, has repostured forces there, it's extremely unlikely that something happens with regard to this question. Now, this is the kind of question, or the kind of response I used to give before I started practicing with the Good Judgment Project or Good Judgment Open. Um, because what it does is it, it initially gives you two pieces of information. Right, they're saber rattling. Very general, very unspecific. I'm not even sure if this person knows, has followed anything about this situation. There is saber rattling. Passive, we don't know who's doing the saber rattling, um, no blames being assigned and no, no details being offered. Followed by US's repositioned forces, which suggests that the United States, that this person knows something about like how things are moving on the ground. But it's also just a generic sort of takeaway statement that doesn't provide any specificity followed by an assertion, right, that it would be extremely unlikely. It might be, but the two preceding sentences or the two preceding facts don't build to that conclusion. Um, it's just a, this is my gut with some sort of preliminary information to let you know that I am a sophisticated thinker because I, I know things. Um, again, I would say that this is not a good example of, of good, uh, reasoning. Here's a third one. Uh, so Iran builds uh, an underground nuclear facility mid-US tensions dash US News and World Report. All this person is doing 
is they're linking to a source and throwing it there and saying, well, there you, there you go. There's evidence. I have provided you a link. Uh, people do this all the time um, on Twitter. This is a very common mode of reasoning. I will just refer to authority. Somebody is saying that there's, there's tension, therefore I can just sort of assert my judgment um, with the backing of this, this article. And then I'll flag this last one, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time sort of tearing it apart because I think it's really interesting. Um, so it begins with, Trump seems, uh, sure seems to want Iran to start something. I was worried about a Gulf of Tonkin incident with Iran before the election, not sure what purpose it would serve now. He seems to want to create as much havoc for Biden as possible. So initially I was looking at this and saying, okay, so this person has sort of asserted that if there's a confrontation, it's going to be a confrontation that is initiated by the United States. And the Gulf of Tonkin um, incident is referring to the sort of event that kicked off military action, major military action against Vietnam, in which the United States sort of became confused about whether or not it was under attack and asserted that it had been under attack when in fact it really hadn't been under attack. So there's sort of this idea that, that the United States might be cooking something up to initiate a conflict with Iran, and this person is sort of flagging before the election. So again, flagging that this might be sort of an October surprise kind of thing that would maybe help rally support behind the president because there's an international crisis. But they're making their prediction after the election and saying, well, I'm not sure what purpose it would serve now. So suddenly they're backing off from that initial reasoning process about what would be the motivation. Right, so the only motivation that this person can come up with right now is, is creating havoc. Uh, but then they follow this up with, ultimately I don't think the military will go uh, along with Trump if he tries to stage an artificial conflict with Iran, they'll find a way to talk him out of it. And so he's, uh, this, this person is providing a countervailing force, right? So they have sort of a motivation, but it seems weak, but then they're highlighting there's, there's something that's holding that back and therefore they think that the balance of those two forces are, we're not gonna have crisis. Now, when I first read these um, two, I thought, well, you're assuming that the only way that a conflict could break out is if the United States initiates it, what if Iran initiated it? And then I sort of read this third paragraph and it really seemed like a, initially it seemed like just dismissal, like a, a the, sort of like the first one we saw where it was flippant and dismissive. Um, it says time is the biggest factor, both US military and Iran have the patience to wait up the inanities and insanities of Donald Trump. He could send a flotilla tortillas through the Strait of Hormuz. I don't care how much guacamole Mexico sends Iran. I suspect they'll wait until Biden became president before celebrating with tequila. If I can, the Persians can, right? So again, right, flippant, kind of insulting, like not really seeming like a serious analysis. And yet, there is a serious analysis embedded in there, which is, I don't think that Iran is going to initiate this conflict because time is on their side and they can simply wait out and would prefer to wait out the Trump administration and deal with the Biden administration in a couple months. And so this actually ends up being a, a fairly sophisticated analysis of how to think about this question about whether or not the United States is gonna initiate and what would be the motivations and constraining factors whether Iran is gonna initiate and what would be the motivation and constraining factors and really balancing that together and pulling it together in a way that I think makes a compelling argument or at least a reasonable argument or at least an argument that we can press at and push at and debate whether or not that, that really holds up. Whereas the preceding arguments were thin, um, I would say did not exhibit characteristics of good reasoning and judgment. And so reading through how other people sort of rationalize and, and justify uh, their predictions help me to sort of recognize how I structure my own predictions. When I explain to people uh, why I think what I'm thinking, to, to not be flippant, to not just sort of toss a, um, a source at them, and to not be uh, sort of vague with then my assertion of my opinion, but to really lay out like what are the countervailing pressures, what are the countervailing forces, how do I fit all this together, and to consider the kind of the complexity of the problems. And I don't know that this is necessarily validated, right? I don't know that I've actually gotten better, but I certainly feel like I've gotten better in terms of my reasoning and my judgment um, by using this process and using this method and doing sort of the, the regular and realistic training when it comes to forecasting and judgment.